Welcome to the Write the Damn Book Already podcast. My name is Elizabeth Lyons. I'm a six-time author, and I help people write and publish powerful, thought-provoking nonfiction and memoir without any more overthinking, second-guessing, or overwhelm than absolutely necessary. Because let's face it, some overthinking, second-guessing, and overwhelm is going to come with the territory if you're anything like me. I believe that story and shared perspective is one of the most potent ways we connect with one another, and that your story, perspective, and insights are destined to become someone else's favorite resource. For more book writing, publishing, and how the heck do I move through this glitch tips and solutions, oh, and plenty of free and low-cost resources, visit publishaprofitablebook.com. And for recommendations of fabulous books you've possibly never heard of, book writing inspiration, and the occasional meme so relatable you'll wonder if it was created with you in mind, follow me on Instagram at Elizabeth Lyons Author. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this next episode of Write the Damn Book Already. This one has been a long time coming. My conversation with author and My friend Bethany Clemenson has probably been eight months in the making. Bethany's book, Ditching the Dream, came out about a year ago. We've been working together for a couple of years, and her travel schedule over the last eight or nine months has caused us to reschedule this episode, I think, eight times. I think it's a record, but it all works out when it works out, and I was so happy to have this conversation, and I think it's a really important conversation because... When you are writing nonfiction that is intended to guide the reader toward a specific outcome, it is almost inevitable that during the writing of that book, you will start to wonder, do I even have enough to say on this topic to fill a whole book? And or do I even know what I think about this? I remember when I was working on Write the Damn Book Already, which was my sixth book for crying out loud. And I've been writing books for almost 20 years. I've been coaching informally for almost 10, and I've been coaching formally for the better part of five. And still, I had multiple moments while I was writing the book where I kind of thought, you know, I talk about this stuff all day, every day, and I feel like I could talk about it until I'm blue in the face and sometimes probably do, according to some people. But how come I'm struggling to fill this chapter or How come my thoughts have somehow seemingly just mysteriously vanished in the midst of trying to get all of them out? It's incredibly common for it to happen. And I think it's an important conversation. I know it's an important conversation to have. And it was a great one to have with Bethany because her entire book is about the importance of following your own dream and figuring out what your own dream actually is, which is exactly what she's been doing for the last eight, nine, 10 months with all of her travels. I find Bethany to be someone who absolutely walks her walk, talks her talk, practices what she preaches, whatever cliche or metaphor you want to use, even though sometimes I think she feels like she's a little all over the place. And she and I truly understand that about one another. We both have a lot of ideas that come into our heads seemingly all at once. And I enjoyed having the opportunity to really ask her how she decides which of those ideas is most important to her right now, where she's going to put the majority of her focus, and how she ensures that the dream that she's pursuing in any given moment is hers and not someone else's imposed upon her, which usually happens when it does happen super subconsciously, but it's what she helps people through. So it's always interesting to me to know, okay, when you help people through this kind of stuff, how do you manage it for yourself? It's almost like with landscapers, I think, I want to see your backyard. And they're always like, yeah, I haven't gotten to it yet because I'm too busy doing other people's backyards. Before we hop into that, I just want to quickly say, I'm going to put a link in the episode notes to all of the resources, all of the areas where you can find Bethany online, her book, social media, and et cetera. And I'm also going to put a link to the Book Writers Collective. The Book Writers Collective is the community that I have been dreaming of forming for years, probably ever since I really started doing this full time. It is a community of us 
aspiring authors and already authors who are working on their next book or their fifth book or whatever it may be. And they really enjoy doing it with other authors. So again, it's community-based. We have once a week co-writing sessions where we're all just getting our butts in the chair, myself included, and focusing on the writing, as well as twice a month coaching, guidance, Q&A, camaraderie sessions where everyone can come and ask questions, share ideas, get feedback, feel supported, and remind themselves that they're part of an author community. So if that sounds like something you've been interested in finding and in trying out, whether you're dipping your toe in the water or jumping back in full force to this writing thing, the link is in the show notes. It is a month-to-month membership, so you can leave at any time, although I hope that you won't ever want to. We are having a lot of fun in there, and I would love nothing more than to welcome you in. Of course, at any point in time, you can email me or DM me on Instagram with any questions that you have about any of my programs, and I'd be happy to chat with you about it. Okay, let us get into this interview with the incredible Bethany Clemenson. So if you can remember, what were like your greatest concerns or fear? You know, and it's not because I like to focus on that. It's because people don't talk about it as much. And I think the assumption is that people who have published a book don't ever have any concerns about it or they don't really struggle with the writing of it. Do you remember what, not even what they were, but what they were that surprised you? Because given what you do professionally, you know, coaching other people through their challenging stuff, did it surprise you that it was occasionally a challenge? I anticipated some challenge just coming up, but um, what I didn't anticipate was the fear that, that maybe people would be offended or I wouldn't see me painting a picture of my perspective of whatever was happening, that maybe that would hurt somebody. Somehow, I guess all that fear came up in ways that I didn't anticipate. I knew telling the story would be hard. Some of the parts of it would be hard or exposing myself. I mean, every writer, I think, goes through that. But um, I didn't expect when I dove into that, not only having that, but the fear of what other people would perceive. So was it their perception of your perception or was it their perception of like what you were saying? What was the... Like my parents didn't want to read the book and I don't know that either of them have because they were afraid that all of their mistakes would be, that they were afraid they would be painted in a bad light, which I would never do that intentionally. I mean, ever. I, I... and and then my husband has said he's gotten through part of the book, but he hasn't read it all because he's afraid. He's afraid like, and he's very private. And so some of the things <laughs> that I share in the book about like our first date and things yeah. like that will probably make him want to crawl in a closet. But um, <laughs> but at the same time, it's my story. Right. You know, I, I don't, I'm not meaning to be disrespectful to anybody, but this is my story, you know. I think that's such an interesting thing. And it's really challenging. We talk about that a lot. You know, what do you do if your story does involve other people? And in your case, it didn't involve other people in a way that was negative. They're just part of your story. But it's interesting that their fear about how you would portray them comes up. And then you needing to figure out how to navigate that. Yeah, I think... Part of it with my family is I'm the direct one. I'm the one that that people go to if they want a perspective of, I'm doing air quotes, truth, right? They'll come to me or they'll share something with me to help problem solve it. And so maybe when the tables were turned, (laughs) I don't know. They were just afraid Hmm. of what I might say. I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, it's funny how we you start to see how other people's minds were in ways that you wouldn't normally like the people closest to you. Mm -hmm. It's almost, it, it almost is unfair in a way, I think, because it kind of opens up a door for them to see something that they didn't necessarily want to see. And not because you're forcing them to do that. I mean, it sounds like they've said like, I'm not going to keep, I don't want to read it or I think they'd be so pleasantly surprised if they did read it. That's the the thing that sort of is heartbreaking to me because you didn't in any way throw anyone under the bus. Right. 
it, but I think we all have fears and sure. I just have to remember, you know, I, I feel like I was courageous in telling my story and all the uncomfortable parts and this, they have to navigate their story, like whatever that is. And I'm okay with that. What was really fun for me was your book is titled Ditching the Dream, which is a little bit of a, it's not a double entendre. What is it? It's a, it's like a euphemism because mm -hmm. It's sort of like the subtle art of not giving a fuck. Like he's not telling people not to give a fuck. He's telling people to give a fuck about certain things. You're not telling people to ditch the dream. You're encouraging people and giving people permission to ditch the dream that maybe isn't their dream, right? And right. to go after their actual dream. Did I, is that a fair summary? Right. With that in mind, what surprised you about what kind of came up for you? as you were writing it. And then in the last year, because we have talked about this, you do a lot of different things and you have your hands in a lot of different places. And did it ever feel like, wait, this isn't like, do you still feel like you're building your dream? Yes. So I do feel like I'm still building my dream. And um, during the, in the book, I think, you know, it's like a giant therapy session, writing a book. I mean, you say that all the time, but yeah. I think one of the coolest things that happened as I was writing the book, once I got past the fear and thank you for talking me off the ledge, like 8,476 times was that I got to see how far I've come. And, yeah. and even um, as recently in the, as like the last month, an, another a friend of mine who published a book had a negative review on it and like lo kind of lost it for a couple hours was just like, Oh my gosh. And how, and I thought, and this is not in any means to be com comparison, but I, that would have messed with me like five, five years ago, that would have messed with me. Mm -hmm. But I had a negative review the first like 10 days of my release. <laughs> I had somebody go on and give me a one star with no words. And then Amazon took it down, you know, but that's like a, that's just one testament of how far I've come. And so if my story and, and the story of my clients or any story of anything and that book touches one person to help them think differently or overcome anything like that, then my work is done. You, you know, like that's right in the, in the book. And I know you didn't ask me this, but there is a part where I talk about when I was working at a bird seed company that we, we sold wholesale bird seed and I was in a horrible relationship and I, and I was hiding and I was just pretending and I would scrape the change off the floor of my car to get gas. And the person that I was with was taking all of the money that I made and, and I was isolated from my family and friends. And there was this woman that came over to me at work and just said something to the effect of, I don't know what's going on with you but you don't have to live this life. You can create a different life. And that those that, that 30 second interaction changed the course of my life. I mean, and granted I did the work and I made the choice, but if that interaction wouldn't have happened, I think the whole course of my life would have been different. And so if someone picks up that book and, and has a teensy moment like that, like, Right. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. Well, it's it's fun. And I, I put air quotes around the word fun because to, to write a book that is memoir-ish, because while it can be challenging to write about different and difficult experiences that we've had in our lives, it does give us the opportunity. Did you ever feel like, oh my God, I can't believe like that's me? Like I'm you almost feel like you're writing a story about. A, another human being entirely because for me anyway, sometimes I look back at some of the things that I've navigated and I, I can't even believe how I navigated it. And that's not to, I mean, yeah, there are some moments when I think, gosh, I <laughs> glad I don't do that anymore. Right. But it does help us to recognize how far we've come and the growth that we have had, especially for those of us who are quite hard on ourselves and, tend to think I'm not moving forward. Absolutely. There, there are points that I, and, and believe me, I don't have anything figured out. Like that I am no guru of anything. I mean, 
But there are points I look back and I feel so separate from that person that I was just because of how far I've come. And I think we all have that. If we look back at our journey, we can see pivots and changes and choices and things that have created the person we are today. And that can be a lot different from the person you were a decade ago. Right. You know, one of the things I really remember when we were working on the book is you feeling like, and this happens all the time, like, is it done? Because you are evolving so much and you still are, right? We all still are. To to your point, none of us is perfect. None of us has it all figured out. But it's Mm -hmm. like, wait, do I need to wait to publish this? Do you remember this? I do. You know what? I have a notebook of things that I want to change about (laughs) the book. Now, like I... I okay. I was listening to uh, oh, it was a coaching call that you did in a, in the membership community, and there was a woman talking about how she wanted to do a playlist, and I'm like, I had that written on my list, and why didn't yeah. I do that? And where is that playlist? And how many QR codes could I make? And like right. you know, down the rabbit hole I go, right? And what would I do? What would I do to add and make it better? Or when your book, um, write the damn book already came out and I opened the front cover and there's a QR code. I'm like, Oh, that's genius. Why didn't I, why didn't I think of that? Because there's so many times when I'm leaving my book in an airport or in a, in a salon. And I think, well, there's no way, there's no way. How are they going to find me? And I, and I do have my website on the back. I mean, obviously you made sure of that, but just something simple. And um, so I don't think you're ever done. I mean, just like, you know, we're never you're, done. you're so not. And it's funny because with the QR code, if I had had that thought when we were doing your book, of course, we would have put it in there. Of course. I didn't have that, right. you know, like I got that thought. God bless about four minutes before I published my book. And I got it because somebody else had done it. And I thought that is a really smart idea. And same as you. In fact, yesterday, I was recording another podcast or a podcast went live yesterday on nine things I wish I had known before I, or, you know, before I did six books of my own. And one of them is that every author, I really believe this goes back, what, no matter the genre they've written. And if they are brave enough to read their own book, they'll be like, I, I could have said that differently, or I should have built that out more, or why is she wearing turquoise whatever whatever yes and so it's like it's never done but you're such a creative person and your creativity has so much energy so I have a couple questions one is how do you channel it like how do you choose you know when you get these ideas oh my god I could have a playlist oh my gosh I could have you know somebody said to me the other day in the same coaching call she said I want my book to be an experience. I want it to have a scent. And yes. I was like, okay, I don't know a hundred percent how to do that yet. I'm sure it'll become a thing, yes. but I don't know. When you get these ideas, how do you, for lack of a better phrase, rein it in and then decide what to focus on now? Once I write it down, I feel like I can let it go because I can know I'm not going to lose it. So if I just get it out of me, then, and sometimes I heard somebody say once you have, you get ideas for three different reasons for you now, for you later, or maybe for somebody else, you know? And so I, I write stuff down and that, and I, I do pen to paper. I'm not a, I mean, I Mm -hmm. love electronics and techie and all that, but, but pen to paper for me. So I have uh, 1000 journals, you know, and they all are different like for different things. And yeah, no, listen, I have, and this is at the suggestion of one of my best friends, Erin, who's also an author and she's a journalist and like the whole shebang. She said, go get, cause she like us has 18,000 journals. And Mm -hmm. if it, if it falls on me, I'm never going to figure out which journal I wrote the idea in. And then that's going to drive me insane. She -hmm. said, go buy yourself a journal and call it the idea journal. And Mm -hmm. every time you get an idea, Just write it down. Don't write down how you're going to execute it, what the strategy is, when you're going to do it. Just write it down so that you don't lose it. Yes. Right? Because for me, I'm like, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose it. You know, and that is a double entendre because I'm going to lose it like my mind and I'm going to lose the idea. But (laughs) Right. (laughs) 
Okay. So that's how, when I came to you and that's what I had done with the stories, I hadn't written the whole story down for the book for all, you know, all the stories in the book, but I had titles of all the, you know, that triggered all the stories that I was like, this, this needs to go in a book someday. And I had no idea, you know, how to put any of that together. And I mean, seriously, Liz, you're magic when it comes to that. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just remember the, our, our first phone call together and, and there's, we have, you know, at least a partial outline done. I say we really, I just sat there answering questions and you were typing furiously, but it was, it was magic because all of the things from my book would have stayed on my, I had a giant sticky note where I'd written everything and they would have been there for years if I wouldn't have had you helping me put all of that together. But thank you very much for saying that. And I want to be very clear. It's not my magic. It's your, I was just documenting your magic because I think we all need that sometimes is the ability to not have to do two things at once. So not have to be the create, not have to use the right and the left brain simultaneously. The right brain is what's creating it. The left brain is what's organizing it. And so Mm -hmm. sometimes without thinking about it, We just need people. And this is why I love book coaching because people will say, I'm stuck. I don't know what to say about this. Even in fiction, they'll be like, I don't know where this story is going. And so Mm -hmm. all I or any other book, you know, coach or guide has to do is ask some good questions. And then without even thinking about it, because you're, when you respond, you're not responding from a place of we're recording. I'm typing, it's permanent, anyone else is going to read it. We're just having a casual conversation. It's all going to come out, but it's coming out, number one, faster probably than you can uh, Mm -hmm. write it or type, which is why I'm typing. And then secondarily, things are coming out that are borderline (laughs) brilliant, but in the sense that you couldn't craft that strategically if you tried. It's the mm-hmm. most organic, authentic statement. It's sometimes how titles come to be, mm-hmm. you know, or stories. You know what I remember? I'm, I feel like I'm sort of pivoting, but not really. And I think this is a super important story. I remember you were, I swear, not days, but you were probably weeks from publishing. I think we hadn't uploaded. We definitely hadn't uploaded because by that point I would have been like, Bethany, we're done. But <laughs> but we were, um, meaning we're not adding anything more to this thing. It's good. Mm-hmm. But we were at the very tail end of the edits and like the bow was almost completely tied. Do you know where I'm going with this? I think so. And you sent me a message <laughs> and you were like, Liz, something's been bugging me. There's this story that I haven't shared and it's really big and it's a big part of my journey. And I'm afraid to share it, but it's bugging me because I feel like this pull, like I need to share it. And I don't, I can still see myself. You told me the story. You're welcome to share it here if you want. You don't have to. I'm not going to share it for you. I almost came out of my skin because I was like, that I, I, you know, I don't say to people that has to go in the book as though it's going to make or break the book. And if you tell me something and then you decide not to put it in the book, it will die with me. But I could feel your heart saying, Bethany, share this, share this, share this. And so I was like, please share. And you did. Now you'll have to go read the book. (laughs) (laughs) To find out what that was. But it was, oh my God. And I, it was such a moment. And it was the kind of moments as an entrepreneur, which I firmly believe if you're an author, you're an entrepreneur and you get to just, it's like, whether you're an author, entrepreneur, authorpreneur, whatever term you want to use, or a, an entrepreneur and you have a business or a service or a product, whatever, you get to decide to what degree you want to dive in to that world. So just because you're an entrepreneur doesn't mean you have to be an eight-figure a year entrepreneur. It doesn't mean that you have to work 17 hours a day. If it did, I wouldn't be doing it. Um, and the reason that I'm so fascinated and always have been with entrepreneurship, including entrepreneurs who are authors, is that 
we see that one moment. So yesterday I interviewed Alex Strauss, whose book, The Joy of Funerals, is be, it was just two days ago re-released on the 20-year anniversary. It first came out with St. Martin's Press 20 years ago. She reissued wow. it this year. And she talks all about why. But I asked her, she's a columnist for the New York Times. And I asked her, you know, did that give you or does that give you kind of a boost in feeling more confident about your writing ability? And she said, no, because all you see is the one article that they accepted. You don't see the nine that they said no to. Mm -hmm. And so the story that you messaged me with and we're kind of like, oh, God, we're afraid for some reason. And I think we're becoming less so. But to share the vulnerable and the hard, because what was it about that story that made you feel hesitant? Do you think to share it? And again, I, people have to read the book to figure. Uh, you know, and I think it was just because it was so close and it was so vulnerable. And so it was like another layer. Like the other things I was prepared because I thought about them. And this was something that just kind of, I don't know, it just came up, right? It just came up as, as we're closing. And I, you know, those nudges where you feel like, so I was trying to listen to yeah. the nudge, but then also fully prepared that you said to me, hell no, because you're, you know, and there were, there were things that were in the book that we went back and forth about that you, you know, we agreed that it, this goes out, this waits, this is a supplement, this is an email it, and, and right. in order to tie everything together. And so I was okay with, it's so interesting what comes up when you when you're writing a book, I, I, uh, I mean, I think everybody should do it because you just learn, <laughs> you learn so much about yourself in, in the process. Yeah. I mean, you're either writing a book or you're journaling because if you write a book and you never release it, essentially you've written a journal and uh, awesome. Yeah. Right? yeah. Good point. But yeah. stuff comes up right. that you, I saw something the other day that I thought was so interesting and I'm trying to remember who posted it. I want to say it's going to kill me that I can't, cite the person but and I don't think that it was it was a guy and I don't think that it was his quote I think he was quoting someone else and and giving attribution but it said I'm pretty sure it was Ryan Holiday and it said write yourself a letter every night and you will solve all of your problems and I was like oh lord and of course then I'm like wait how do I do that do I write it from the perspective of my future self my current oh, right. self do I address do it I need, to myself what <laughs> do I have to get a new journal for that is there a particular color that I need? Do I need a special pen? Hang on. Do I need to do it in calligraphy? I need to go get one of those things and dip it. And then right. I'm... <laughs> what time do I do it? Wait a minute. Every night or just five Does days? Does it need to be a full moon? Does Mercury need to be in retrograde? Like, what are the rules here? It's a nightmare being in my head sometimes. And of course, the poor person is like, no, get a fucking piece of paper and a number two pencil and do <laughs> it. What the hell? It's a mess. It is a mess. But so with all of your different layers of creativity, because, you know, we're talking about courses, you coach and courses and you have other things that you do that you're so passionate about in the senior living community. And which is there are great stories in the book about that and many lessons that you've learned and that I learned through you from people in that community. Because of course, they the old cliche is true. When you get to the end of the, your life, you don't sit there and think, man, I wish I had, you know, you might think I wish I had bought a calligraphy pen, but you don't ever think, I wish I had made $17 billion selling calligraphy pens, you know? Um, right. So when, you know, and courses and all the different things that you do, beyond the idea notebook idea, what's grabbing you right now? Like of all the ideas in the notebook, what makes you feel, and let me just cut you off, not cut you off, but let me ask a question and then answer it from my perspective, as you know, I tend to do. And then I'm going to ask you again. The other day, I got so confused over how many things I have out in the world between books and courses and downloads and templates and a shop. Now I don't have a Shopify store anymore. I canceled it. And an Etsy shop, like all the things. I was like, this is ridiculous. I got a poster board and I wrote, it's sitting right next to me. And I wrote out all the things that exist today. And then I went through with a highlighter. It, I like Marie kondo the hell mm. out of this poster board. It was like, which of these do I feel 
an inner like, yes, too. Like, I still Mm want to do this. Which of them am I still doing because they're money generators? And so I feel like I should keep doing them, but maybe I have outgrown them. And which Mm -hmm. of them did I think were a good idea? And then I got into it and I was like, I don't know. I don't want to do this, but I'm hesitant to let them go because I put so much energy, time and potentially money into starting the thing. Right. So I feel all that. Okay. And I, that's why I brought it up because I feel, I feel like you'll, you get that. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I go. Okay. For right now. And I don't hold myself to a five-year plan. Sometimes it's a quarterly plan. Like last, Mm -hmm. this past summer, beyond being so hot, I almost died many times. And I was afraid to walk to my mailbox because I live in Phoenix. And I thought if I go down, I'm going to get third degree burns. (laughs) But it was the summer of connection. That's what I focused on was like meeting, finding new people on Instagram who I really enjoyed following, connecting with people, making actual, I wasn't focused on selling. I wasn't focused on writing. I was just focused on connecting. So sometimes I do like a quarter long thing. Sometimes I do a year long thing, but what do I want to focus on now? How do, how do you do that? And what are you focusing on now? So it's interesting that you say that about your big board with all your things on it, because I actually started doing a very similar thing um, about three weeks ago. And I have taken everything that I have out there and it's kind of just been on a big pause because um, the word community just keeps coming up for me at every turn. So I've been, I live most of the year in the North woods of Wisconsin, I'm in a like a town of 800 people. I'm very remote. You know, it's two hours to any type of airport. Sounds um, amazing. And- <laughs> I but- never thought I would say that I might show up on your doorstep soon. You are welcome. We have a cabin at Airbnb that's almost ready. So anyway, um, I've realized how lonely I am feel. And so entrepreneurship is lonely and I want to build a community. I want to build a community of people that are, I know this sounds so cliche, but they're going after their dreams. They're consciously creating a life they can't wait to wake up for. And not that everything is perfect and rainbows and butterflies, but that I want to navigate life with a community. There you go. And so I couldn't agree more. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I definitely love the community I'm in with your membership. I love coming to that space where it's full of writers and 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 collaboration and ideas are flowing and that's so much fun. And and I'm looking at developing a space um like that. And and it would be people that have either read my book or interested in creating a life on their terms or whatever. So a community. So, right. I love, I love it. And I love following everything that you're doing because, you know, there could be the assumption that like, well, I don't know what there could be many assumptions, but you, to me, here's something interesting. I don't know if I've ever told you this, um, but sometimes I feel like, you feel like, and maybe it's me, I don't know, Some let's use psychotherapy. Maybe I'm projecting or reflecting or whatever they would tell me that I'm doing. But it's almost like you feel like you're off the path because you're not doing either what you expected you would be doing post-publication or you're not doing what other people expected or think you should be doing post-publication. And the funny thing about it, and not in a haha kind of way, is that when I watch what you're doing, I'm like, you're so aligned with the message of your book. Whether you're putting together this Airbnb or you're out just sitting by the lake with your husband and your family, or you're on the water, or you're traveling to do a speaking thing, whatever it is, you're I don't know if you feel that way. So I'm kind of asking, but Mm -hmm. from my perspective, you're so in alignment with, and I'm sick of that word, but it's, it's like, you are just doing, you are practicing what you preach. You are walking your walk and talking your talk. Yes. And I would agree. And, and I think that's a conscious thing to stay in that place 
all the time when there's so many there's so many people screaming at least where mm-hmm. i go online if you haven't made eight trillion dollars in 7.6 hours then you're a failure you know there's so many people screaming that message and i'm so tired of that whole jargon and that i just I don't know why we only equate success with an exorbitant amount of money. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having money. Like, I'm not saying we shouldn't have money. But why do we have to have eight figures or seven figures or any figures to make an impact? I don't feel like that goes hand in hand. And so that's been a huge part of my journey because I chased money and figures for years, for years, and yep, yeah, and Me too. And, and, and I was empty. I was empty and like mm-hmm. dead inside, <laughs> right? And and right. so figuring out how to be a hundred percent me, right, and in, in alignment, uh, living out what I feel is my purpose in a multitude of different ways, and and navigating all that, even from a, a financial aspect, from a community aspect, you mm-hmm. know, all of it. Mm-hmm. You know, so so yeah, I. I am. Um, you're you're spot on. I mean, I feel like, uh, well, you're just my people. I mean, you've been my people from the time that I've I we first spoke. I just well, and to your point, I mean, there's nothing wrong with money. Like sometimes I feel right. like I have to say that as a caveat because I love money. I, mm-hmm. I absolutely love it. I love what it allows me to do. I love who it allows me to help. I all the things. It's just right. that I would like two things to be true. I want to be deeply at peace with what I'm doing. I want to feel deeply in love with the life that I'm creating. Not every minute. I mean, when I have to do my accounting, I am i don't think I'm ever going to be in love with that moment. So right. the whole thing, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. My God, I work every day. And it feels like work for some portion of nearly every day. Because if I have to get into data or accounting, oh, it's just, it's like, I want to put on the hat that says, no, thank you. But to be able to have both of those things be true, I mean, in my early, not to go too sideways, but in my early 20s, when I first came out of college and things were not then like they are now, I mean, you almost everyone got a job coming out of college, you know, back in the back in the 90s. And uh, it was a very lucrative position because that's how the world worked. And mm-hmm. so I made a lot of money for a 23-year-old person but I wasn't me. Right. I wasn't operating from a space of what does Liz want to spend this money on? I was operating from a space of what is everyone around me telling me I should spend this money on? Right. And I didn't even recognize myself when I looked in the mirror. It felt like it didn't matter then. And I was so young. I mean, my God, I look back and I'm like, geez, that's just crazy. But, um, Last question. You do a thing and I do it too. And I love it where you leave your book in just random places. Mm-hmm. Right. Like airports and I don't know. What what are some of your yeah. other fun ways to just keep just keep it going after all this time? I mean, it's only been a year. It's only been a right. year. And that's right. why I was so excited to talk to Alex because 20 years, you know, and you and I have talked about my first book still is my is my best selling yeah. book. Is it's 20, it's not 20 years old because I did a relaunch. I think seven years ago, but it's seven years old, Mm -hmm. you know, so we can still just keep going. What are some of your favorite ways to get resurgence when you feel like you want to? Gosh. So most recently uh, I was, I went to an in-person networking event. I had to drive 40 minutes to get to one, but it's okay. And um, in the course of it, they were doing an activity with part of the group and then the other part that had already finished the activity. We were just kind of mingling and I don't even know how it came up, but my book came up and I ended up giving my book to a woman. I had my book and the journal and she had lost her husband in the last year and a half or so. And her then, then she was an empty nester. So her kids had graduated and moved and she was getting ready to take a solo vacation for the first time in her life, um, going to the Caribbean somewhere by herself. And she said she'd been hoping for something that could help her navigate what was next. And I'm like, <laughs> there you go. 
And so, and I know that's a, like a, it's not like a massive, you know, influx of whatever, but, but I, I've gotten to the point, Liz, where I carry my books with me and when it feels right and good, you know, uh, and, and I like, um, I love leaving them in places. And initially I was signing my name to it. So like, maybe they knew it was from me. Then I felt kind of yucky about that. So now I just leave a note that says, you know, if you, if you found this, it's for you. And I don't say like, love Bethany. because I'm the author and I'm right. right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It just felt like, so, and plus if like I would get in trouble for leaving it, they wouldn't know it was me. Maybe. I don't know. Like I'm not. Oh, that's a, a good point. Anyway, I never thought about that. I've left mine um, in some, some questionable, not questionable, uh, not like that, but you know, places where I've thought, Oh God, I, you know, if they find this and think what the, what the hell is she doing? You know, but as it, you know, so what? I had somebody uh, reach out to me on Facebook and she found my book in airport and said she was at a huge turning point in her life and it was exactly what she needed. And thank you so much. And so I love that. that. Cool. I'm still waiting for that moment. Yeah, when someone I, I, is like, I found the book. I'm always like, did someone, I left one at my, where I get my hair done, like two months ago uh -huh. and it haunted me for days. I was like, did anybody take, did they have to throw it away? Like, did any, <laughs> so I'm waiting for that, you know, that, but you were for that woman who was getting on the cruise and moving into empty nest, nest lifestyle, what that woman was for you way back when, when you were picking up change off the bottom of your car. Right. right. right? Yeah. I hope like, even if there's just five words that, Gave sure, her some hope, sure. right? That's, that's again, I mean, I feel like we've come full circle, but exactly. that's exactly, yeah, that's what, I don't know. That's what matters. I left my book in the, you know how, when you go in the airport bathroom, sometimes there's a shelf behind the toilet, but you can put, you know, like put your phone or whatever there, there'll be like an in Yeah. I don't shelf. like this idea already. So I left my, <laughs> it was first thing in the morning. <laughs> So I left my book, <laughs> my book there with a note once, and I was like, giggling all the way out of the bathroom. I don't know why, but and like, yeah. okay. I don't know why, but the, anything involving a bathroom, I do. Now there are some that maybe like I'm thinking about. For example, um, we have a place here called Flower Child, or we have a big, uh, cool restaurant, bar, coffee place called the Henry. Their bathrooms are as cool as the rest of their environment, mm -hmm. so I could see mm -hmm. leaving it there. But in airport, <laughs> I don't know. I just was like, I. it was again, it was like, okay, you have to leave this here. And I was like arguing okay. with myself. And I'm like, okay, right. I'll, I'm going to, I'll leave it fine. I'll leave it here. Fair it's enough. Even, when I went to the networking event, as I was getting ready to leave, I didn't have a book with me. It, I wasn't going there to talk about the book. And I just felt like I was supposed to. Yeah. Bring the book and the workbook. And I, I literally had an out loud conversation, like arguing with myself in my office before I left. Like, really? Okay. All about me. Like, why am I? Okay, fine. I'll bring it. it like, I don't know who I'm talking to really, but I was doing that to myself. <laughs> so, um, and I'm glad I did because look what happened. And, right. and that's cool. And just pay it forward. I know that's right. cheesy too, but you know. Well, it's like, I think it's common to feel uncomfortable giving your book to somebody because it, for me, it feels like I'm saying this is the solution to all of your problems. And I'm yeah. certainly not saying that. Yeah. But the way right. I reverse it is if someone were to be like, here, I have an extra copy of this book. You want to take it with you? I, I mean, hello. Like I'd be elated beyond. So right. we, it's just what it, what is our brain doing? Which is, it is great. But Okay, absolutely. So I, the, since I'm in a tiny town, the ladies at the post office, you know, all two of them, I know right. them, right? And as I'm in there getting packages and whatever. And I, so recently, so I sent my book to um, Mel Robbins and then I heard her podcast with her mother-in-law and her mother-in-law was talking about um, how she has friends with dementia. And I have a, I obviously have experience with that and I have a great resource for that. So I sent her mother-in-law that book and then I also sent her my book and highlighted some parts and like just told her thank you for being proof for people that it's because she's thriving at like almost right. 86. And I was so touched by the podcast. And then I sent I sent a book to Amanda Francis 
Um, and then I also sent a book to Drew Barrymore. And so over the course of the last, you know, few months, and so they've watched me. And every time I come in to get a package, they're like, have you heard anything? What's <laughs> going on? And, you know, and so then uh, this week, one of the workers said, I was looking, I was looking at your website online. I have a sister. My sister is a nurse practitioner. She's realizing she's not doing what she loves. And I just kept thinking about you and your book. And I'm like, hold that thought. I went and got her the book and gave it to her, you know. And so I don't know, things like that. Like that's, it's small moves, like small acts. And that's, that's fun for me though, to be able to. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. It's fun. It's joy. It's just joy to be, I mean, you just can't, there's, I don't believe in coincidence. And I think that when those moments show up, you, we all, I don't want to say we all, cause I, I don't know, but I wrestle with them sometimes, certainly. Um, mm-hmm. but I'm just learning and have learned just go with it. Like go mm-hmm. with the whisper. Yeah, absolutely. And that's when I feel like I'm truly doing what I'm su- not supposed to like in a pressurized way, but you know, I'm really leaning into who I am and where I'm supposed to be in that moment is when I am slowing down enough to listen to just like with your list that is this really you know bringing me joy is this what i love right. does this light me up and if not okay let's mark it off and move on to the thing that does and well i'm so glad that we got our schedules coordinated and me we too finally did this thank you so much thank for you. being here and everyone go grab a copy of ditching the dream i'll link everything in the episode notes to your site your book your instagram all the things so people can find you perfect thanks so much